Hi everyone, um, we're Team Dynamo, and we're going to be doing our resource limiting guide for the country of Ukraine. Um, the name Team Dy Dynamo comes from the Ukraine and football team. It's actually called Ukraine Kiev Dynamo. So that's how we refer to the name. And let's get started. So a little bit of history and background. Um, the name Ukraine means borderlands, and it borders the countries of Romania, Poland, Moldova, Russia, and Belarus. Um, the flag, as you see here on the screen, the colors represent, um, the yellow represents wheat, and the blue represents the sky and the streams. And let's see what else. Um, their main natural resources are rye, wheat, and sunflower, and they're known as the breadbasket of Europe. So Ukraine has a lot of history with war and revolution. Um, they've been ruled by the British, the Germans, and the Russians all at different times. Um, so there's been a lot of war and oppression. They've struggled for their freedom and their independence. Um, so in 1992, they actually declared independence from Russia after the Soviet Union fell in 1991. Okay, some unique things about their culture. Um, one of their biggest holidays is the Easter holiday, and they have this thing that you see here on the right, I think it's pronounced Sanky and it is made out of beeswax, and it's multi-colored, multi-layered, and it represents life, but it's really unique in that um, the colors can be melted down and they're in different layers, and so the different colors represent different things, like if they were to melt it down to say the color yellow, that represents the harvest of their wheat and rye and all of that natural resources. So also they have a they have some things that they use to celebrate their culture during holidays. Um, like food wise they have it's called I uh, have some trouble pronouncing some of these words, but um a varenki. It's like a peroni. You guys have probably had peronis before may or may not. It's like a pasta noodle with like potatoes and onions inside. And then Horika is vodka. Um, and then they have a style of music called bandura, which is a string instrument, and it's um, their national instrument as well. And then a Kalina dance, which is a folk dance that represents Ukrainian pride. And then they also, um, they also celebrate Lent, and so they have seven holy days without self-indulgence. And so now I'm going to turn the rest of the next part of the presentation over to David. Um, okay. So something else that they have um, cultural uniqueness during the, the Holy Supper, which is on Christmas Day, the, the Last Supper for those who are Christian and know about culture and everything, what they do that's kind of unique afterwards is they have the youth, so they have toddlers, kids, they walk around the neighborhood and they sing Christmas carols to all the neighborhood families and stuff like that. Um, they go and they sing like Christmas carols, like the Ukraine Carol of the Bells, um, and they do this just so that they can collect donations for the church and everything. Um, and then after they get done caroling and they get done serving the community, those same families that they ask money for, they all go back and they meet up for midnight mass. And then after midnight mass is when they eat and indulge in all the good food that they have. Um, so some holidays that Ukraine has, um, a lot of them revolve around either independence or it's celebrating um, some type of, you know, victory on the war or just from like Nazis and everything because from the start of the Ukraine history, um, like my partner said, there was a lot of wars, a lot of oppression. 
Um, they have to fight for their freedom the majority of the time. So when they have holidays like this, um, they celebrate, they go all out, they make sure they have all the same traditions, they make sure that they have all the same foods from last year, um, they make sure everybody's eating, nobody gets left out at all. Um, even people who are like, you know, you have bad blood during that time, they kind of just squash the beef just so that way they can enjoy uh, the holidays and everything together. Um, gift giving doesn't really play a large role when it comes to their Orthodox Christmas, um, and that's just because they, they believe in like just spending time with one another. They don't really believe in like giving gifts back and forth like we do um, in the in the Western culture. They do celebrate Christmas on actual Christmas Day like we do, but because they're um, they're Eastern Orthodox Christians. They have their own Christmas, which is on January 7th, which is what they all like to celebrate a lot. Um, some religion and key terms for them is they're very high context, polychronic and collectivistic society. So again, like with the Russians, um, they're very traditional. They don't mind having meetings go over times because they think time is just infinite. Um, so they really believe in making relationships uh, during businesses and stuff like that, more than that so as being on time and being punctual and everything. And then they really believe in, um, like, it, it takes a village to raise somebody, so it's not necessarily just one person having to go out there and do all the work. They believe that um, everybody in the village should contribute, everybody should be participating in, um, you know, being good to one another. Uh, their religion, it revolves around uh, the, the Slavic religion because at one point they were taken over by the Russians and everything, so all their culture had to mix. Um, so they believe in three different gods. They have um, an earth god, a heaven god, and an underworld god. And they, let's see, they, their names is, the heaven god is Perun, the earth god is Svavarg, and the underworld god is Sivitopi. Um, but something like them is that even like the Indian culture, how they have many gods uh, for many different things, they don't know if they have that same type of structure. So like how the Indian culture, they have like one god for every different aspect of like life and like the world. Um, they don't know if for 100% because not a lot of the stuff was recovered because of all the war and oppression and stuff like that. They've had a lot of buildings being destroyed um, that it just kind of like kind of erased some of the history for the Ukrainian people. Um, some specific cultural practices that they have, like my partner said, uh, they have the dancers. Um, weddings are a really big, huge part of their culture. It's not just like the bride comes in and the groom comes in and everything like that. It's more or less um, they believe in equality, so both the, bride, both the bride and the groom go into the, the house at the same time and they all get married and then afterwards they have a big, huge feast, they have a lot of food, a lot of dancing. That's probably where the Russians get the stereotypes that they drink a lot of vodka because for the Ukrainian society, that's where they do indulge in a lot of um, alcohol, specifically vodka. Um, and then during Easter, they have these specific Easter baskets. Um, they fill in the Easter baskets with those eggs that they died with, um, with different breads and foods and stuff like that. And then afterwards, um, after the service that they have is when they eat all the food. So they don't eat it right as soon as they get it. They get the baskets from their friends and family. They fill up the baskets and they take the baskets to church. They have the service, they celebrate it, they have the holidays, and then once it's all over with, then they eat it all together. Um, and then so another cultural practice that they have is the traditional egg smashing contest. So they get the eggs that they decorated and they just throw it on the ground and they pick it up and the egg who didn't get cracked or didn't get damaged in any way is like the winning egg, supposedly. And then here are just some traditional foods that they eat. The, the pasca is the Easter bread, so that's where they, they put that bread in the basket specifically. Um, the kutia, that's just a mixture of like nuts and grains and wheats. Uh, they use that during the um, during the wedding ceremony, along with the Olivier potato salad. Um, again, that's just a lot of mixed nuts and berries just kind of put together. But these dishes, they, they're always seen in every traditional holiday and everything. Um, 
the kutia, they make sure that everybody at least has one spoonful of it. They consider it disrespectful if you're not eating it and everybody else is eating it. And when they hand out the food, they always do it from oldest to youngest. And then they wait for everybody to be served, and then they all eat together. And these are just some of their natural, just like everyday cuisines. Um, a lot of the stuff that they had, again, dealt with like wheat and rice and grains and all that good stuff. Alright, so my point is on demographics. Um, since Ukraine, I was, it's a poorer country with a lot of multiple different countries. We see a lot of different influence uh, between um, <coughs> many different cultures and many different titles and the people affiliated with. Um, so one of the major languages, although it's spoken in Ukraine, um, they speak a mixture of either um, the Ukraine, Ukraine, yeah, but also on the far eastern, uh, near the border between them and uh, Russia, most people speak um, Russian just because of geological um, aspects that in turn are different. Uh, and um, we see that, that there is one million Ukraine, Ukrainian Americans um, having um, either a descendant or relation to um, Ukrainian descent which is 0.3% uh, of the U.S. Like, population. So it's just a demographic. Um, you see that uh, Ukraine actually has a really high um, uh, death rate, and they have really low fertility rates. So in Ukraine, there is uh, a high abundance of people in mid-age, between the uh, average age, which is probably about like, 32 to 33 years old. Um, there's a lot of youth and a lot of uh, small number of older people, elderly. Um, so this is something that, even though they are a collectivistic um, society, it is something that uh, tends to be a little bit more than the other side of the map. And then for some of the non-verbals, um, the way people introduce themselves is a uh, first name, um, the patronymic, and a last name, so stating who they are. Um, <coughs> Family, family as well and their occupation. Um, they are very um, uh, tangible speakers. They do a lot of hand gestures. They do a lot of uh, hugging, uh, kissing on the cheeks as well. And um, dress and attire is very important to them. So the way that they look at the, the status. Um, some stereotypes is uh, they believe that a lot of uh, Ukrainians overeat. That's actually a false statement. Uh, nearly less than a quarter of Ukrainians overeat. Also, uh, there's a stereotype that Ukrainian housewives, Ukrainian women are perceived to be housewives, and that's also uh, another preconceived notion. Um, there's more women in the Ukraine culture now that are in the educational programs and the workforce than ever before. Um, also, they also believe that alcohol is a pastime, that's also false. Um, but it's no higher than the, the year of average at five inches per year. Uh, change, um, challenges with uh, language barriers. So basically, there's uh, cultural differences between Americans and uh, the Ukraine culture. Uh, it's actually impolite to stare and kind of like glance politely at somebody. Uh, they believe that women shouldn't uh, formally shake hands with new acquaintances because their culture frowns upon it. Um, I'm not going to out of time, so. Uh, however, uh, Americans are not as hospital don't, don't have enough, don't have as much hospitality as Ukraine culture due to um, the gifts and the treats that the Ukraine culture offers when you're staying with a member from the Ukraine culture. And yeah, that's a very good thing. Thank you. All right, so anybody have any questions? Are you done for a Ukrainian Easter basket or an American Easter basket in terms of like food? Ukrainian Easter basket. Yeah. The American Easter baskets are just filled with chocolates and candies and you know, sweets and stuff like that, where Ukrainian food, it 
it's actually building stuff that's good for you and stuff that you know will actually last a while because of the culture that they have with like war and everything that's why they keep like bread and potatoes and stuff. And their their Easter has a lot seems to have a lot more meaning as far as that kind of stuff goes. You know, the egg actually represents something than just a piece of chocolate. Yeah, because it's sweets. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's more like a more of a cultural effort instead of a more of like a commercial standpoint because it's here in the US and all that. Everything is just about selling, but for them it's more about culture, uh, playing by tour vision, and they didn't have it like that, that they were uh, close to. Okay. Did I hear correctly the number of Ukrainians in the US is 0.3%? Yeah, it was 0.3%. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're the third largest country that. Uh, over a million Ukrainians live in America. Okay. So why do you think they're moving to the US? War, depression, that's just all it is, right? As soon as they declared independence in nineteen twelve, they just got it bombarded by the Russians and by Poland and by the Germans, I believe. Don't quote me on the last one, but they it's just they're even in war right now. Like it's just it's a non ongoing battle between them because of the resources that they have, the geological frame that the country has, how it's like so super flat and you can create farmland and stuff like that. So a lot of people just want to take it over for its resources and use it for themselves, but the Ukrainian people are so prideful that they're not just gonna roll over and let anybody come into the land and take it over. And they also have like I believe it's the only one water port in that area, which is the Crimea and Russia has recently taken taking that back from them. Um, in terms of um, ethnic identity, um, do they more align themselves with the dominant culture in the U.S. or with any other cultures here in terms of ethnically? How? Um, I did read in one article that we used for our um, research that when some of the, when they were immigrating over in the beginning of what well, was in the 1800s, that the Catholic Church kind of shunned them, and so they started joining the uh, Russian Orthodox Church churches. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and this was a particular community in Chicago. Okay, but if they were in a room with members of the dominant culture in the U.S., would they ethnically be different? Yes. Okay, what way? Well, we are an individualistic culture. Mainly the dominant culture here is, and they're a collective culture. Mm -hmm. So that would be one, one of the main. I'm talking about visually. Oh, yeah, I would say no, because uh, visually they're the only white, the only white, so. Yeah, I mean, you probably, you know, so. if, if you were like around, if they if you were intermixing a lot more, you would probably start noticing. You'd probably be able to start noticing, but yeah, for the most part, they are okay. the same one for the okay. And from your research, how are they transitioning to the U.S.? How are they, are they, is it a smooth transition? What are some of the obstacles? Well, what I read is that most of them come with little to no money, and if they do get money, it's set from the Ukrainians from America, but then money gets sent back home for them to uh, but as far as like finding jobs and stuff like that, it doesn't really affect them because they align themselves with the dominant culture. Right. Like their beliefs and like you know their nonverbals and stuff may not align perfectly with them because they're Russians and everything. But as far as like being able to blend themselves in with the American, like it, they don't really face too much oppression over here as far as being the other. They try to find certain communities that have a high population of either Russian or Ukrainian or anything Eastern European. So when they do tend to get to those certain areas, to be on the East Coast and Pennsylvania and many different uh, states along that region, um, they are able to have a support system to where the culture shock isn't anything extreme. Um, the only thing will probably be like a language barrier between Ukrainian and Russian to English. Um, but besides that, they try to find communities that are easily relatable to them. So it makes a transition a little bit. So you actually answer, I think my next question is, is, is there a um, geographic area that they're relatively migrating to? 
Yeah, it's close to the east coast. Close to the east coast, so then part, different parts of Canada as well. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? I know you don't have a computer. No, I didn't want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.